Happy Easter Sunday to everyone out there. I hope this video is finding you well. If you don't already know, my name is Dustin Bauer and I'm the leadership chairman here at Faith United Methodist Church. First off, I wanted to say on behalf of the leadership teams at Faith and Hope Churches, as well as Pastor Clark Hess, thank you very much for joining us this morning for Easter Sunday services. Now, obviously, this Easter Sunday experience is much different than ones we've had in the past. Typically, people plan ahead and they go out and buy the clothes that they're going to wear to church Easter Sunday. And they plan ahead and on, plan on the feast that they're going to have with their friends and family following the church service. We like to control the little things like that in our lives. We know what to do. We know what to say. We know what to think. But what about right now with everything that's going on in the situation that we're all going through? We don't know what to say. We don't know what to think. We don't know what to do. I think that's when it really hits us. The fact that we don't know those things actually says everything. For us, having control is a thing. We fool ourselves that our work ethic controls our finances, that our food choices control our health, that we have our future planned out. And then this happens. All of a sudden, Disney is out of magic. Paris is no longer romantic. New York doesn't stand up anymore. The Chinese wall, no longer an impenetrable fortress. And the holiest of places on earth is empty. Hugs and kisses suddenly have become weapons to us. And not, not going to visit our friends and family that has become an act of love. We have been humbly reminded who really is in control. This leaves us just one thing to wrestle with. And that one thing is whether or not we can actually trust in him. Psalm 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. We need to think about that. With everything that is happening, we are being forced to take a step back, being forced to be still. How can we not trust in him when he loved us so much that he sent his only son to live among us, only to die for us and rise up again on this very day? Easter may be different this year, but it still means the same thing. And that's why we have an awesome video for you guys today. People from both of our congregations have come together in a sort in this Easter Sunday service video. There have been hours upon hours poured into praying and writing and recording and practicing and videoing and performing and editing all so we can bring this video to you. Also, we can bring the same rejoiceful message. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Now with that, there is a Easter Sunday worship guide that got sent out. If you'd like to follow along with that, we're going to get started with the call to worship. If you don't have one of those worship guides, don't worry. I'll put the words on the screen for you. So if you would, please join me in the call to worship. The stone has been rolled away. The grave clothes are lying in a heap. The body is gone. Mary's weeping is halted by the man's question. Why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Let us proclaim with Mary. We have seen the risen Lord. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen.
gather here today to praise you. Grateful that we are, that you have always been with us. At this most holy season, Father, we gather to worship you and the resurrected life of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. We can never atone for our sins on our own merit, Father, without Jesus' sacrifice of his earthly life and shedding of his blood at Calvary, we would be forever lost. Lost from ever being sheltered by your presence and our soul's salvation would only be a fading desire. But we know that from the beginning it was your plan that your children would have a way to come back home. You have provided such a plan for us here in this time as it has been and continues to be for these many years that a father would sacrifice his firstborn son for the saving of all his other children is beyond our comprehension, but it shows the depth of your love for us. And in our humanness, we adore you and love you fully for what has been freely given us. However, we confess that we have not always lived our life that would reflect that love. As you did on the day of your resurrection, Lord Jesus, you have walked along beside us, opening up the scriptures to us, that foretold of this time, assuring us of your resurrected life that brings us salvation and life eternal. But our eyes were closed to realizing your presence and our ears closed to understanding the depth of that love and the mystery of your abiding presence. You have shown us the treasures of what your King has to offer, but often our eyes have been blinded by the glitz and the glitter of this world and our unruly mind jaded by the whispers of the hidden demons. And now, we are in some trial, Lord. Are we being weighed in some balance? Could this be the forewarning of things to come? We are hesitant to consider it a foretelling of apocalyptic events to come. And yet, you have visited upon your prophets of old matters of lesser impact. So with guarded intrigue, a touch of fear to identify it, but with a tinge of spellbound excitement, we faithfully wait. Guard the machinations of our heart that we not recklessly say our faith will see us through when we haven't first come before you, laying those unconfessed sins of commission and those times of failing to see and reach out to help those in need, when it is within our ability and capability to do so. We ask you, Father, to lay your hand in healing and, and salvation of their soul's desires upon those within our congregation who have longed for a healing of their own personal bodies and yet are being held off because of this virus that has delayed their, their surgeries. We pray for especially those who are going into an unsettled time with this virus. They're fearful and confused and they're struggling to find meaning in it all. Some are without jobs and struggling to keep going. Help us to value this in every day, to selflessly take opportunities to show love and care for another, to humbly nurture our relationships. And when we cannot do what we do, then galvanize to do what we can. We ask that you give guidance to our president, the governors of this nation, their teams of medical specialists, and for those in the field scrambling to keep up a flow of needed equipment and supplies. We pray especially for those that are on the front lines of this fight. Put your shield around them, for they are exposing themselves daily to the risks of confronting this major health threat. And for us, Father, we wait humbly before you Grateful for the time of this season, its meaning. Saddened that we cannot be together, but we know that we are all together in your family. Please join me now in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Today's scripture comes from the book of John, chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. 
Listen to the word of God. Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. She said, They have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Peter and the other disciple started out for the tomb. They were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He stooped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there, while the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Then the disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside, and he saw and he believed. For until then they still hadn't understood the scriptures that said Jesus must rise from the dead. Then they went home. Mary was standing outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she stooped and looked in. She saw two white-robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. Dear woman, why are you crying? The angels asked her. Because they have taken away my Lord, she replied, and I don't know where they have put him. She turned to leave and saw someone standing there. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. Dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked her. Who are you looking for? She thought it was the gardener. Sir, she said, if you have taken him away, tell me where you have put him and I will go and get him. Mary, Jesus said. She turned to him and cried out, Rabbi, which is Hebrew for teacher. Don't cling to me, Jesus said, for I haven't yet ascended to the Father, but go find my brothers and tell them I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene found the disciples and told them, I have seen the Lord. Then she gave them his message. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God for his holy word. Happy Easter. Now, does anyone know what Easter is? Easter is when we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, resurrection is a big word. It simply means to rise from the dead. That Jesus Christ is alive and with each and every one of us today. Now, to understand why this is such a joyous occasion for us, you have to go back a few days. You have to go back to Good Friday. Now, do you remember what happened on Good Friday? Good Friday is when Jesus was crucified, that he died on a cross. And if the story ended there, it would be a very, very sad story. So the question we have to ask ourselves is why did Jesus have to die on a cross? To understand that, we have to understand something called sin. Now sin is quite simply those wrong things we do, those bad things we do. So for example, have you ever gotten in a fight with your brother or sister or some other kid? Is that the right thing to do? We know it's not the right thing to do. That's an example of sin. Have you ever lied to someone? Have you ever decided not to do what your parents have told you to do. Those are all examples of sin. Can you think of some other examples of sin? Now, here's the problem. Just like when we do wrong things, 
were often punished. So you would lose privileges. So you would maybe not get to watch a TV show that you really wanted to watch, or you may not get to go somewhere that you wanted to go. Those are punishments. And just like there's punishments when you do thing, wrong things, there's punishment for our sin. And to understand that, you have to take a look here. And let's consider this yellow ball represents God. This red ball represents us. This blue one in between is sin. Because of our sin, we are separated from God. Worse yet, nothing we can do will remove that sin, will remove that separation from God. That's where the cross comes in. Because of what Jesus Christ did, because he chose to die on a cross for us, he removed that sin that was separating us from God. Because Jesus Christ died on a cross for us, we now can live forever with our Heavenly Father. Here's the more important thing to remember. You see, it wasn't truly Jesus who died on that cross. Like I said, he's alive and with each and every one of us. It was our sin that died on that cross. Because of what Jesus Christ did, that sin that separates us from God is gone. And we can now live forever with our Heavenly Father. And that is why we celebrate Easter. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the wondrous gift of your Son, Jesus Christ that because of him, our sin is removed and that we can live with you forever. Amen.
share with you today from the 20th chapter of John's Gospel around the theme of seeing Jesus today. But let's name right off the right off the start, that it's more difficult to see Jesus today in the midst of this coronavirus pandemic. It's more difficult to see Jesus because of the pain and peril we see on the faces of people all over the globe. And it's more difficult to see Jesus today because of the groans and the grief and the lament we feel as we watch more and more and more people succumb to this disease. But it's also more difficult to see Jesus today because we can't gather together in person to sing songs of resurrection joy. We can't gather to hug each other and to pass the peace around the refrain, Christ the Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. This is truly a bitter, sweet Easter. And yet we can't love what we cannot do, keep us from doing what we can do. And so we've gathered some folks from Faith and Hope Church and they've been recording some elements of an Easter celebration. And I'm grateful for Dustin taking those and weaving them together in this service that you're experiencing this morning. And oh, do we need the Easter story afresh and anew, especially in moments and in times just like this. But we also need a fresh perspective on the Easter story. I think one of the blessings of this Easter might be the fact that we can't simply go through Easter as we always have. Sometimes I wonder if we get so focused on the trappings of Easter, the notion of Easter, the way we celebrate it, that we don't allow the message of Easter to change our hearts. Perhaps that's how God is gonna work this Easter, with a fresh perspective on it all and giving us capacity to see it anew with fresh eyes and ears. If you'll remember back in the fall, I shared with you the idea of, of the group called the Story Corps. They go around the nation to record people's stories. In fact, uh, the essence of what they share is that everybody has a story. And a person's story is made up of the fact that they want something in life. But they have to overcome some things to get to that point. They have to overcome some struggles, some challenges, some tensions, some conflict to reach what they want. Well, I was reading a while back, Brian Wilkerson, pastor of Grace Chapel in Lexington, Massachusetts, had the innovative idea of looking at the Jesus story through this lens of the story core. And I wanna share a little bit of the context of his life as it leads into this Easter story and especially how it intersects the life of Mary Magdalene, as we see in this passage in John's Gospel. Allow me to share a little bit of that story, the Jesus story, from this perspective. The Jesus story begins really as a classic rags to riches kind of story, at least in that genre. A child is conceived out of wedlock, born to a peasant couple on the road, a long way from home. His first night in the world is spent in a barn, they wrap him in clothes, lay him in a bed of straw. He grows up in a backwater town, spends early years of his life in obscurity, working a blue collar carpentry job, providing for his family, practicing the religion of his people. At the age of 30, though, he breaks into the public scene, making a name for himself with rousing sermons, promising a coming kingdom. He speaks of a new age, an age of peace and justice for all people of God's goodness filling the earth and healing the nations. He speaks about God as if he knows God and God knows him. And he speaks as if he's on a mission to accomplish something. But these are no mere words. He backs them up with actions. Everywhere he goes, people are healed. Blind people see. Paralytics get up and walk. Hungry people are fed. Those beset by demons are set free. And he gathers around him a small band of men and women, a dozen zealous, untested men and a handful of capable women, one of which was Mary Magdalene. But like every folk hero, the common people loved him, but the authorities, well, they were alarmed. Soon great crowds were following him everywhere. Rumors and expectations are getting out of hand. So the authorities put in motion a plan to get rid of him. 
The tipping point comes the third year of his ministry. He comes out of Galilee with fire in his eyes, marching toward the capital city, Jerusalem. He arrives just in time for the holy days. And as he enters the city, crowds come and out to greet him, lining the streets and hailing him as their coming king. His followers are pumped. And this is the moment that they've been waiting for. This is the moment when they were finally break free from the rule of Roman law. But suddenly the story takes an unexpected turn, a darker turn. Instead of leading a revolt, Jesus seemingly turns inward. He begins to talk about suffering, death, and the fact that he'll be gone for a while. Crowds quickly lose interest. One of his own men sells him out. By the end of the week, people are abandoning him. The crowds simply depart. He's placed under arrest. His friends are nowhere to be found. He's sentenced to death by lying priests and a cowardly politician. After a public beating and humiliation, he's marched out, to the, out of the city where he's nailed to two timbers between two thieves and hung there to die in the midday sun. Jesus' story ends in death, just like every other human story. He dies virtually alone. A couple of mostly strangers come to take his body down and hastily wrap it for burial. In one sense, it really was a rags to riches, back to rags again story. In fact, his own disciples, his own followers go into hiding, disillusioned and afraid. It was a remarkable run, but it's just short-lived. But on the third day, some of the women, a few brave and loyal women, came out to the grave to pay their last respects and to prepare the body for burial. But when they get there, they find the tomb broken open. The tomb busted open, the body, it's gone. And then soon enough, a heavenly being, an angel is before them, saying Jesus is alive again. He is not there, he's on the move and he wants to meet them once again. He wants to resume his mission and he wants them to be a part of it. And so the story's not over. In one sense, it's a rags to riches to rags, back to riches again kind of story. And that's the story that's been told for centuries now, over and over again. A story that changes lives and brings hope. It's a remarkable story, it's familiar to us, in fact, so familiar that it, uh, perhaps we can take it for granted, and yet when we really grasp the story, it fails to surprise us, it fails to grip us in our heart of hearts. But let's go back to that story core definition of a story, a character that wants something, but has to overcome some things to get there. What did Jesus want? Well, that could be answered in many ways. One of the facts, he wants to restore Israel to its fortunes. He wanted to make God known. I think I would most naturally respond by saying Jesus is ushering in God's kingdom. But the more I began to reflect, I thought of a verse earlier in John's Gospel in the 10th chapter, when he said this very explicitly, I have come to give you life, and to give you life abundant, life to its fullest. And isn't that what we all long for in our hearts and souls? Life, not just a common, everyday, ordinary, make it through the day kind of life, but a life lived to the full. In fact, earlier in the gospel, he said it's described like this, it's called eternal life. Not a pie in the sky when we die, but a life here and now that extends into the future. In fact, it gets better every step of the way. He came to bring us that kind of life. But what did he have to overcome to give us that life. The same things we have to overcome, sin and death. Now, not his sin, but our sin. He was the sinless one, and yet he was chosen to be the one who would bear that upon himself. And so he had first to overcome sin. 
everything wrong with the human race in this fallen world. And he did just that. He took on sin head on. In fact, if you look at the context of these closing chapters of John's gospel, you see that he did this. He took on the foolishness of the crowd. They would praise him one Sunday and cru shout crucify him the next Friday. He faced the faithlessness of his own disciples. He faced the jealousy of the religious leaders, the brutality of the soldiers, the cowardice of Pontius Pilate. He faced it all, absorbed it all, and forgave it all. And in that moment, he overcame sin. But he also had to overcome death. Death, the last enemy, the undefeated foe, the end of every human story. But Jesus took on death. His lifeless body was laid to rest in a stone-cold tomb. And yet three days later, the, he burst the door of that tomb off its hinges and opened the way to eternal life. Or in the words of the Apostle Paul, where is your sting, O death? Where is your victory? Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Christ Jesus our Lord. So that's Jesus' Easter story from the story core perspective, and it captures the essence of the Easter message, and I hope you grasp it in your hearts this day.
Maybe that's all the time you have to listen this morning. And with that, I send you on your blessings. But perhaps you want to listen a little further to hear this kind of approach to Mary Magdalene's story and to our story. With that, I invite you to listen on. Mary's life intersected Jesus earlier in her life. When the scriptures in Luke 7, I believe it is, describe that she was a tormented person, possessed by seven demons. And we don't know exactly what all that meant. It could be literally that she was spiritually oppressed by demonic forces. It could be she struggled with some physical illness or some psychiatric disorder, or she could have suffered from some kind of addiction. But here's what we know for sure. Jesus set her free. He liberated her. She was a new person. And because of that, from that moment forward, she demonstrated a courageous following of Jesus. She was expressed a courageous devotion to Jesus. In fact, when we get to the end of the story, as we have, when all the other disciples and followers had fled, not Mary Magdalene. She was with them at the cross every moment till the end. She was the first one to the tomb the next morning to anoint his body. And so her life indeed intersected Jesus. But this is where the plot in Mary's story takes an interesting twist. She wanted something, she wanted Jesus. But now as she watched him die on the cross, that dream was crushed. She was experiencing grief beyond measure. She experienced the ultimate conflict when the very one she wanted to serve is now gone. It was conflict, the ultimate conflict, irrevocable conflict. She couldn't bring Jesus back to life again. No way to resolve this kind of conflict. And that's when her life intersected Jesus yet again. And it changed her life once again. She's in the garden, approaching the tomb, when she hears a voice. What are you searching for? Why are you crying? Assuming it was the gardener, she gives a response. And then she hears a single word that literally gripped her heart and changed the trajectory of her life from that moment forward. The single word intersected her life afresh and anew. It was her name, Mary. And she immediately knew it was the Lord, raised from the dead, speaking her name, calling out to her. In fact, I'm reminded again back to the 10th chapter of John's Gospel when Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. They know my voice. And I think at that moment, Mary knew Jesus' voice. And she knew in her heart of hearts, he was no longer entombed, but alive, risen from the dead. It goes to show us that our faith, genuine faith, is always personal. And I want to ask you, have you yet to take hold of a real faith? In fact, I would say it this way, you have yet to take hold of it, unless you've heard Jesus call your name. Now, not audibly, but inwardly, but assuredly. And I think now more than ever in this coronavirus pandemic, we need a fresh and anew to hear Jesus speak our name and to call us out once again. Well, what happened in Mary's life? Again, it was a life made new. In fact, it was an incredible witness to those all around her. In fact, you know what we discovered? Mary was the very first Christian, the very first missionary. She was the very first person to believe that Jesus died and yet rose again. And she was the very first person to go and tell others that he was alive. And she spent the rest of her life living that message. Her life, a witness, a testimony, a life made new. 
Now, there's a bunch of physical evidence. In fact, scholar after scholar studied the death and resurrection of Jesus, even secular scholars. And they've come up with an impressive array. It's one of the most historically verified events in human history. But you know what stands out to me? It's the human evidence of lives like Mary's changed before people's eyes. Lives made new. Think of the disciples themselves. Jesus tried to convince them he was going to go to Jerusalem and get handed over, arrested, beaten, flogged, killed, crucified, and then raised from the dead. He told them over and over again. They just couldn't hear it. They were oblivious to those realities. And then when those events started unfolding, they scattered. They were terrified. They were afraid. They denied, betrayed. But then fast forward a bit. Something happened. In their lives, something happened to catalyze them, to change them, to transform them from this cowardly group of disciples hiding away in an upper room to a bold force to proclaim the risen Christ to a broken world. Their lives were made new and that human evidence made all the difference in the world. And that human evidence gathered together and made historical evidence. There was a whole movement that happened because lives were changed and they were touching the hearts of those all around them. Something happened to give birth to a spiritual movement that human history, like no other, experienced. Lives made new. Well, I believe that story can intersect your story and I believe it can change your life as well. That if Jesus conquered sin and death, he can conquer whatever in the world is getting in the way of what you want and what you want to become. And for that matter, as we deal with this coronavirus pandemic and all of its implications, because Jesus confronted death and sin and overcame them, no matter what we're going to encounter in this crisis, we can know and know with assurance that God can still make us new in the midst of it. And so I have some story core kind of questions to ask you this morning. What's this, what does the story of your life say? What does the story of your life tell? What do you want most in life? And what do you have to overcome to get it? What do you have to struggle with or contend with? in order to reach what you want to achieve. And where might Jesus intersect your life? Here and now. Well, I just want to end with this. Your life, your life can be a convincing Easter story in the lives of those around you. It can be the most convincing Easter story the people around you have ever witnessed. In fact, God can use your story to help another person experience their Easter story of Jesus intersecting their life. Others are looking to see Jesus through you. Perhaps now more than ever, looking to see Jesus through your life made new story as they reach and search for God in the midst of these trying and uncertain times. And so I end with this, as Jesus did with Mary. He called her name. And I believe in my heart is calling your name and mine. If you listen, you can hear it. He's calling your name. He wants your life to be a made new story that he can use so that others can see Jesus today.
so much we have been able to do. Haven't you enjoyed the music of resurrection this morning? Haven't you enjoyed the prayers prayed and the community notes shared? Haven't you enjoyed time with children? Haven't you enjoyed opening the gospel and hearing about lives made new? Well, there's a lot we can't do this Easter, but there is something we can do. We can worship our risen Lord. In fact, as you follow the worship guide that has been sent to you, you've noticed that it has a blessing at the end. I'd like to simply share it with you as an expression of our faith and invite you to share it in your home and with your families. How joyful it is to celebrate the good news of God's love. We are called to be Easter people. Darkness cannot claim us. Fear cannot bind us. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Amen.